Welcome to the show. My guest today is Kyle Thomas from Exhorter. Uh, but besides Exhorter, he's also been in some other great bands, including Trouble, Alabama Thunder Pussy, Floodgate, and many, many more. So, And he's also working on a solo record that will be out at some point. Uh, but in this episode, we're going to go over his whole musical career from the time of almost birth to right now. And lots of great stories along the way. And I think a lot of good lessons, too. And, and I'll be first to admit, I wasn't aware of Exhorter before uh, this interview. But now that I've discovered them, I am a fan. And I'm a fan of Kyle's other bands, too. And I love the idea of him, him doing some sort of solo tour where he can play songs from all the different bands that he's played in. And I think that would just be a badass set list. So uh, we just need to be able to find the right musicians for that. And uh, hopefully that happens at some point. Anyways, here's my interview with Kyle. Enjoy it. Welcome, Kyle Thomas of the Chuck Shoot Podcast. How are you doing, Kyle? I'm doing fine, Chuck. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is exciting. I did. I I got a. Your fans are gonna hate me right now, but I did not know of your band. But uh, after I, Sean reached out, I started listening. I I'm a fan of all your work now. Like I, I discovered you, you're in a bunch of bands. Like and it's all great stuff. I would say which band. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, well, I started with Exhorter and I was like, oh God, this is really good. And then I started getting into a uh, uh, floodgate and um, is it, what's the one death? Is it death by Texas? Oh, heavy as Texas. Heavy as Texas. Sorry. That, that one was really cool too. And yeah, there's just like Jones lounge and the list goes on. Jones lounge was a little harder. Fine. That's only on YouTube, but yeah, that was never officially released. Right. So uh, at some point we're going to do a proper release for that, but that's going to take a lot of coordination and effort and I don't have time for that right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, but you could get that on Spotify at some point. I mean, that's not hard to do to get the rights to it right. or whatever. Or... Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, you started out and then your first band was Armageddon in 1985. You did covers and originals. And then the first song you wrote was night stalker at age 50. That's yeah, pretty cool. Right, Done your homework. <laughs> yeah. So that's exciting. Yeah, that to write a song that young, that's got to be uh, that's pretty impressive. Like some people don't get into it until later in terms of songwriting. A little bit of an advantage because before I even picked up a bass and I picked up the bass when I was, uh, I think I was 14 going on 15, perhaps. No, no, no. I was 13 going on 14. So uh, I started playing the bass you know, eighth grade. And, hmm. but I had five years of training, uh, like, like actual private lessons training on trumpet. So right. I had a really strong foundation of music fundamentals. And, uh, you know, I gave up on the trumpet. I never really wanted to do the trumpet. I wanted to do the saxophone because I right. figured I could, you know, get a bunch of babes playing the sax <laughs> and my dad couldn't afford it. So I ended up stuck with the trumpet and, and who wants the trumpet player, right? Right. So. <laughs> the trumpet. Well, it's funny that even like you thought sax was cool. Cause like now that, that seems like an old man instrument, but like, I do remember in the eighties, like that was kind of like the cool hip thing to do was play the saxophone. It was like sexy. Yeah. There's like maybe two or three sax solos in the world ever, or, or sax appearances that aren't sexy. And, you know, they, they, they scream to me in in the night like <laughs> like nails on a chalkboard. But but I, I was totally about the sax when I first saw it uh, in third grade when the music director was trying to recruit people, and I just knew I had to have it, man. And I got stuck with the trumpet. I, I got really good at the trumpet. I just never had a passion for it. I never mm -hmm. wanted it. So, uh, but I'm grateful now that I had those five years of training on it because what I what I gained out of it mostly was just comprehension of the fundamentals of music which is critical for a musician uh it, it's not it's not a, a deal breaker if you don't have it but it, it makes a huge difference your timing your pitch all kind of stuff yeah it seems like music spoke to you at a young age. i've never i've been doing these interviews for i think i have 160 or something and i've never heard of somebody you your first music memory was when you were still in diapers you actually remember yeah. hearing the beatles that's crazy yeah. yes and it was uh Probably, uh, probably a year or less, you know, year, year and a half after they actually broke up that, uh, <laughs> that I actually had that experience. Um, and, and, you know, in a cloth diaper, it wasn't even the disposable kind, it was <laughs> kind of held together by a big baby pin, you know? And, yeah. uh, I just, I remember hearing hmm. 
come together. We had it on eight track um, and it was playing in the living room and I was running, 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 playing. And, and I heard uh, uh, one thing I can tell you is you got to be free. And as, as soon as I heard that kick drum pumping that, man, I just stopped and I started shaking my hands to it. And, <laughs> It's amazing you can remember that far back though. Like I, I'm trying to like my first memory. I don't even know if I remember anything before five. Like that's crazy. <laughs> I, I I have a lot of memories from early on. It when when we were kids, or you know, getting towards teenage years. My friends, lifelong friends, and my brother and all they like. Man, Kyle, do you remember this? Because I was the one that always remembered. They they'd all tend to forget things over time, and and I I don't know. I just always bookmarked them. Now. Ask me what I had for lunch yesterday. I don't know. But <laughs> all the old stuff, you know, that it's that that short term memory versus long term memory right. thing. Of, you know, I guess I burned up too many brain cells in the nineties. <laughs> I heard it was fun, but I couldn't verify that. I don't remember. <laughs> so yeah, so your singing style. I mean, is it hard to sing in that kind of screaming style? Like, how hard is that on your voice? And especially as you get older, does it get harder with age too? Actually. For me, it's easier to sing like that than it is to sing clean vocals. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, now you have to you have to do it right. Uh, and, and really, it's funny that you say that because when I when I finally got pulled into singing, which wasn't my choice, I was a bass player mm -hmm. and uh, made the mistake of opening my mouth at some band rehearsals, and then the next thing you know, everybody wants me to sing and and give the bass gig to somebody else, which I wasn't happy about because I was a bass player. But um, by the time I joined Exhorter when I was uh, 16 years old, um, the next year I said, well, I'm, I'm going to join the school chorus and, you know, see if I can just get a little bit better. And, and I, I really made a, a mistake and it was a disservice to myself to set the bar that low because I ended up excelling at choral singing and uh, it's it was probably the, the best musical decision I ever made to join the chorus because uh, it took me from being a guy who can just get the job done with singing to actually being like now I'm an instructor. I, I teach I have, you know, a dozen students that, that I teach every week. So um, I, I've accomplished quite a bit in the choral singing world and singing on stage with a symphony. Uh, to a you know sold out theater two nights in a row singing Beethoven was hands down the most incredible musical experience of my life uh, better than any heavy metal gig I ever played or a punk rock gig or anything like that so um, learning that style uh, probably saved my voice hmm. so uh, I have a lot of students that that started out you know singing some of them are recording artists too and and they started out singing like I did, singing extreme, and then, you know, come to me for help for things like that. My, my voice hurts. I, I think I'm doing this wrong. And that choral, uh, actual traditional style of choral singing, it, once you learn that, it makes what you're doing with the extreme vocals a lot easier to do mm. and extends the life of your instrument, which is your body. Yeah. So how did you come up with that style, though? Because, again, like you said, the band started in 1986. I don't remember any bands in 1986 doing that kind of like screaming kind of music. Was there any I know that, you know, your list of influences is pretty deep, but I don't know that there was too many bands singing like that. Were you trying to emulate anybody or did you just kind of create oh, that on your own? Uh, I mean, I'd say my earliest influences for the extreme kind of style, really, the the, the first the first thing I sang along to that I realized, oh, wow, I can actually do this. I was actually singing along to the first Wasp album. And Blackie Lawless is a much better singer than he probably gets credit for. Uh, but he does have a very growly, gravelly voice. So I was imitating that. Hmm. Um, and then, you know, I started getting into I, I was into heavy metal exclusively at that time. Uh, you know, Queensryche, Twisted Sister, Wasp. Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, ACDC, you know, all the classics from back then. But I always gravitated towards the next heaviest thing. And then I started hearing Slayer, Metallica, Merciful Fate, um, Celtic Frost, Exodus, 
Megadeth, all these things started creeping into my life. And then eventually I started aligning myself with punk, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the earliest versions of uh, Corrosion Conformity, you know, the Animosity album, um, Agnostic Front, DRI, Dead Kennedys, and all these different styles. You know, a lot of those things are very similar, but they're also very different. So, I, you know, I just really took a little bit of influence from a lot of different directions. Um, you know, namely, I'd say on the punk rock side, Mike Dean and Reed Mullen from COC were a huge influence. Uh, and then, you know, Roger Murray from Agnostic Front, uh, Jello Biafra, Dead Kennedys. Uh, of course, you know, Johnny Rotten from Sex Pistols. And then in metal, I was really influenced a lot by James Hetfield, Tom Araya, uh, Don Doty of uh, Dark Angel. Um, they, all these things just kind of, it, it, it's almost impossible to come up with something 100% truly original anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's okay, I think, to take a little, uh, a little nod from your, your influences, as long as you're not like, plagiarizing them in any kind of way but you know it's more of an homage i guess you could say to uh to your to your mentors to uh to to have some sort of quality about them in you i mean uh you know have you ever seen video footage of ozzy osbourne meeting paul mccartney it's it's incredible he looks like a little kid in a candy store yeah that's awesome Wow, I, I don't know if I have seen that. I, I would have to check that out. That's that sounds amazing, though. That's that's really cool. So yeah, so that's interesting that um, that you mentioned that a few times. How you guys were kind of more embraced in Exhorter. You were more embraced by the punk scene than the metal scene. Why, why do you think the metal scene didn't embrace you guys? At the time, at the time, hair metal was a big thing. Uh, okay, you're talking summer of 1986 is when we debuted, and. Uh, for the love of Christ, we were as ugly as sin. I mean, we were just <laughs> uh, incredibly unattractive young men. And, uh, and everything about successful heavy metal bands in New Orleans, uh, they all played covers. They, 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 they all got cornered into playing covers. And maybe they were allowed to play a handful of original songs here and there. And we were the opposite. We played all originals with maybe a cover or two thrown mm. in. So right there, the booking agent that was uh, kind of a big deal around here, he, he uh, I think a couple of guys in the band, two or three of the guys in the band had been in some of those heavy metal type bands before that, and they grew disenchanted with it and split. And, uh, and then, you know, by the time we put everything together, it was just, no, we're going to do it our way. Well, that between that and just the fact that we, wore regular clothes we didn't wear spandex and makeup and teased hair we didn't do that stuff so we were just not a part of the metal the metal scene hardly at all i think we did one gig under that promoter uh and 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 that was a one and done thing uh it, that was it was kind of like a uh a, an all day you know 10 bands on a sunday afternoon kind of gig and mm. we uh, well, I mean, we stood out like the turd in the punch bowl, you know, and uh, but but when we did our actual our very first gig, um, the punk rockers, we had all started going to see the punk rock gigs and uh, and there was a, a a group of punks called the Swamp Rats. And they they were basically, you know, just fans that that got together as a group and promoted punk rock gigs i mean i saw agnostic front gbh dri the, the, my first summer introduction into punk uh, a lot of really great gigs and uh i mean they had been they had been doing it well before i went to my first gigs but uh but they were the ones they said y'all want to play okay no problem come play and and we just connected immediately with that mindset that theme uh in fact the first gig we ever played uh, there was a lot of local band. It was mostly local bands, but actually, no FX actually played that show. Mm, that's Same a big show. one. Yeah. So yeah. then, how did you get signed? Because you did get signed eventually. So you must have built up a following through the punk scene. 
Yes, uh, we built it quickly. We did maybe two or three gigs as a support act for the bands that were the bigger bands around here. Uh, you know, bands we looked up to for sure, but we saw right away that we were ascending even higher than what they had done so far. So we said, well, screw it. Let's, let's book our own gig and see what happens. And next thing you know, we're headlining our own gigs, playing VFW halls and, and, you know, stuff like that, uh, kind of do it yourself gigs, but we were booking them. We were getting the, the PA uh, rental taken care of on our own, our own merch. And we were like pulling 500 kids back in like 1986 uh, doing all ages gigs. It was incredible. It was, hmm. it was so special at the time to be so young. And we really had no idea, you know, like for me right now, like 500 people now is a good gig, but <laughs> we were 80, you know? Yeah. Well, so. it's easier to get kids to go to shows back then too. Cause there wasn't YouTube and TikTok, and all, there was less stuff to do. Like it was, they wanted to get out of their parents' house. Now kids like want to yes. stay home. There was also, uh, it was also a lot harder for the parents to keep track of where the children were. True. So. <laughs> true. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> Tracking apps and stuff. My parents, had they known half the stuff that I did, they probably would have busted me upside my head. But, uh, you know, that we just found a way to get it done and, and, and stay out of trouble. I, you know, I, I got into a lot of things, but I wasn't a kid who was like in and out of jail or anything. So uh, I, I think I just towed the line a little bit, you know? Yeah. So why didn't you guys, I heard you say you didn't have a manager for Exor, and that might've been one of the, the biggest things why your band didn't get bigger. Cause I think it should have been huge. Like, I think it's such a, such a great band. Why didn't you have a manager? Was there. Well, what we, what we failed to have most of the early part of our career was, uh, what's the best way that I can say this. We failed to have a shared vision about how things needed to be done. And, mm -hmm. Uh, there was a lot of disagreement from within and that, that really killed us every time. Every time we broke up, it was because it came to some kind of climax where we disagreed on something, whether it was artistically or business wise. Um, but that killed this band so many times. And every time we get back together uh, to try and, and, and breathe life back into it, it always came back bigger than it was before. It's the most hmm. insane thing you know and 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 this last time around 2017 when we put it back together again same thing here we are you know when we leave you know there's a plateau here where we could have been and you know we we, we debut back here so we're like we're always chasing where we feel like we should be hmm. but this time around uh it was it was a blessing to come out with this band being in such demand so Yes, I firmly believe, and I don't mind saying this, and somebody can say I'm full of myself, and I don't care. If this band had never failed, I don't have any reason to think uh, that that we could be as big as any of the bands out there right now. Um, you know, at, at least to the point where it's a you know a fully functioning headliner everywhere we go. Um, you know, will we as, be as big as Metallica? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, you know, and we'll never know <laughs> unless unless we get that big after after, you know, a few years chugging along this way. But, you know, for me right now, instead of pining over what could have been, I'm, I'm just blessed that we uh, and feel fortunate that we have the opportunity to continue on. Uh, and I, I'll tell you this much. Uh, what's today? Uh, July 27th, 2021, this band is bigger today than it was yesterday. And it's bigger than it was the day that it was started. So every day, this band just continues to get bigger than it was before. And as long as that's happening, I, I think it's, it's up to us not to screw it up. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one, one other thing though, that I, that made me uh, kind of curious was that you said you didn't tour a lot with Exhorter back then because the drummer was in college. Do you think in hindsight, do you think you should have just said, given him like an ultimatum and said, look, we're all in on this band? Because it seemed like, I don't know, it seemed like maybe the rest of the band was more all in like they did. Or I don't know. Did they have other things they needed to do? Because, I mean, that could have been something that if you wouldn't you want to tour like as much as you could. Well, 
Chris made the best decision he could have made in his life by going to school because he he's a business owner now. He he's uh, he owns a, a a band instrument store, so they okay. they've got four or five locations. He even had his own uh, fishing charter company for a while. Chris has done quite nicely for himself, so he made the right choice for himself. Um, you know, at the time it was you know tough for the band because I I. I went to college for one semester and then I quit so I could focus on music and none of the other guys really did uh, go to college. So we were there sitting there going, yeah, we want to go. And, and, you know, that's no knock against Chris. I no. think maybe at the time, at the time there might've been some frustration and, and resentment over it. But um, by the time we got back, uh, I want to say right, you know, probably by the time we were touring for the second album, Chris was in a position where we could tour. Uh, so, so we started touring and, uh, and then, you know, you can't blame Chris for, you know, you can't blame all this on Chris, but we, we made a lot of bad decisions. We behaved poorly on tour. We turned tours down, um, you know, got kicked off of a tour. So, uh, you know, we, we, all the legends that you hear about this band, some of them might be a little exaggerated, but most of it's true. We were, we were really probably a bunch, big bunch of assholes. And, uh, and that doesn't bode well in the business world. And mm -hmm. I learned that quicker maybe than some of the other guys did. Uh, and by the time I got out and started floodgate floodgate was absolutely business first, business first, business first. And uh, it showed with, you know, by the time, uh, uh, the end of 1996 came around. We were doing direct support for Sepultura on the Roots tour, playing hockey arenas. You know, this big difference from getting kicked off of club tours. Yeah. So wait, which tour did you turn down with Exhorter? Was, was there were these big ones or uh, some of them we turned down just because we, you know, we couldn't play the gig because we didn't have a drummer hmm. available. But uh, I mean, there was, I can't remember. I think there might've been tours with like Sepultura, you know, bands that were, uh, that were of, of our ilk and at all, right around at our level. Uh, you know, it, at, at the time I would say Sepultura really hadn't, hadn't broken yet. So mm. they were maybe, you know, if we weren't on the same level, they were just a little bit bigger than we were at the okay. time. Wow. So, you know, that could have just as easily been us playing on that arena hockey arena tour. You know, gotcha. Uh, if if we had done things right, but we didn't. We made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. So you you try to learn from those mistakes. So then, yeah, let's talk about Floodgate. You took you mentioned that you took a business class at community college, and you wanted to run this band like a business. So how did you do it differently? Uh, well, for starters, we didn't uh, threaten anybody with violence when things didn't go our way. <laughs> uh, Okay, that's a that's a good tip. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, that basically, what I did was, uh, for starters, I got management, and mm. and we actually had Chris Nail from Exhorter, the drummer, uh, was our manager for oh. uh, for the early years, and you know he he oversaw our business dealings. You know, helped me deal with the record label um, and liaison for this and that, um, and and really, I just kind of. I, I set a really high bar that of, you know, things that I wouldn't settle for less than. So we, we, we were very adamant when we did our negotiations with Roadrunner that things needed to be a certain way. And, uh, and we ended up with a really solid product. That album has stood the test of time. A lot of people I know still listen to it daily and, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of people that critics and stuff that, that hail it as a classic and, and, and as a pioneering type of album. And, you know, I, I look at that album and I think it's really good. It's, it's not quite what I envisioned it becoming, but that's what happens when, you know, you, you, you're young, you need, you know, to have a label uh, to approve of this and that there's uh, you know, a producer involved that, that you've got to, you know, kind of agree, uh, come to, a, you know, agree to disagree on this and that with. So 
at the end of the day, I'm still happy and proud. I'm, I'm, I'm happier with that album now than I was probably when it came out. But uh, there, there, we were really just kind of in the early writing process for that band and the stuff that we were writing around the time that everything kind of went and fell apart for us. The, the music was just so much more mature and involved. Uh, but it is what it is, man. We, we, uh, we attracted people were attracted to floodgate. And uh, I, I think part of the problem though, was since we were like a bluesy rock metal ish kind of outfit at a time when new metal was starting to grow. It, it's not unlike what happened with Exhorter. Exhorter was a thrash band and death metal was coming in. Mm. So, we were kind of odd man out there and same thing happened with floodgate. We were, you know, we were more probably along the lines of a sound garden type of band than we were uh, a new metal band like corn or something. And, mm -hmm. but, but that was what was big. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think eventually Roadrunner gravitated towards bands on their label that were in that new style. And we kind of fell yeah. out of favor. And it sounds like there was some bad luck. Like there was a licensing problem too, because originally the band was named penalty and then you had to yes. change the name so that you lost some momentum. Like people were yes. looking for the penalty album and then, you know, they, yes. they were like, wait, what happened? And so you named the album penalty, but it was still, you probably lost a little bit of momentum there. And then there was like this radio station that finally played your song on the radio in, in Ohio. And then they got a business and it was just like, and it sounded like the label didn't put a lot of support into the album either, which is, no, they they really didn't, man. They they, uh, we 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 kind of got that uh, that tour with Sepultura on our own merit. We were contacted directly by Gloria Cavalera, and uh, and so Chris Nail, our manager at the time, contacted Roadrunner and and said, "Hey, look, you know, y'all make this happen." And then Gloria ended up calling us back going, what's wrong? With, what's going on? I, I just contacted them at the label and they're trying to get me to take this other band instead of y'all. And she said, I, I told them absolutely not. We offered this to you guys. And I don't want them trying to. Yeah, they were trying to push the label was trying to push a different band. That, that's yeah. that's bizarre. Like, I mean, obviously it was a band on their label, but like when they offer it to you, like, shouldn't you guys get that? Get, I and mean, that's kind of strange. Especially, especially when, okay, let's say that you're the label and you're not happy with the way things are going for this band. Well, isn't this kind of like a gift from God here, you know, for this band that's yours? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It, it I, you know, I have to, I have to be fair because um, there were a lot of great people at Roadrunner. Maybe I don't say this enough. There was a great team there, uh, and most of the people that were assigned to work with us did an outstanding standing job and really believed in us and, and and were good people to us, especially Monty Connor. I mean, he really believed in everything that I've ever done. Probably why Exhorters with Nuclear Blast now, mm. because Monty Connor is there and he believes in Exhorters. So, so uh, you know, it, it's, you, you have to do the best that you can with what you've got. And when I've got a team of people that believe in my product, I, I always try to keep a good relationship with them and, and, and make it, you know, give as much as it is take. Uh, but at that time, I, I, I think it was man. I think it was upper management and, and ownership really that, uh, that had fallen out of favor. I, they really, they, they wanted to can exhorter before we did the second album. And, and, uh, and Monty wow. told us that he said, man, it's, I told them if they go, I go. And so Monty put his neck. Jeez. On the for exhorter and they said okay you get another one and and uh you know that one did okay but between us getting kicked off of tours and you know thrash metal was just kind of fading away at the moment uh in favor of death metal it was just kind of a death knell for us yeah but like you said one of the things you learned was don't be an asshole to people be nice and uh it paid off for you because when uh, floodgate did some shows with trouble you hit it off and then you later became the singer of trouble. That's just it, man. Uh, I was raised in a way to treat people as you expect to be treated. And, you know, he, sometimes you have to draw a line and, and, and stand up for yourself, of course. But, you know, for the most part, most business 
uh, that's done, you know, and there's a lot of shady business out there, uh, but most of it's done on a handshake and a smile. And until someone mm. gives me a reason not to believe that, uh, that we can have a good relationship like that, I try to maintain one. It just makes sense. Yeah, no, that may, that's awesome. And so that, that, that was another band. And then another band, you were in Alabama, Thunder Pussy, love that name. But you said that was the the hardest working band that you were ever a part of. So how did how are the, how was that different than other bands? How did they work harder? Well, when they first started, that was in a time around the time probably that Floodgate was ending for me, and I had decided to start a family and just kind of you know give take a new crack at life, uh, put music on the shelf, and so I you know I got married, I had children. And so I, I wasn't really involved with the scene at all, but I remember, I can remember driving my work truck on, on my way to my daily job and seeing posters on uh, telephone poles, Alabama Thunder Pussy, you know, and it wasn't like one time, it was like over several years, every few months I'd see Alabama Thunder Pussy, Alabama Thunder Pussy. I was like, man, that band's always playing. And, uh, and then by the time I got introduced to them, um, it was after Katrina and uh, my first marriage had failed and I was in a transition point. So I was like, man, let me try music again and see what's going on here. And so they invited me to try out. I did and got the job and we did the album. I'm so proud of that album. It's a really good album. Uh, a lot of things I wish I had done differently, but that was my first album in, I want to say, uh, probably a at least at, you know upwards of a decade so uh so wow. i, I, I kind of get my feet wet again and that was a learning experience for me but but along the way they were very efficient they had at this point recorded five you know five albums before that something like that uh it, like i said i really didn't know much about the band before i i even auditioned for them so i, I wasn't it wasn't like trouble where i was a fan of trouble mm -hmm. and i joined trouble as a fan i I, I I do like Alabama Thunder Pussy's back catalog. I do, and I admire it greatly. And the and the members that were there before me, but you know, it's not something I grew up on. So it was just you know, I had to learn the old songs when we play them live, and and I I enjoyed every minute of it. It was great, but uh, I I don't know. I just we we played so much. We were road dogs. They they had a very efficient style of writing. Mm. Uh, they 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 get the songs in a good format and then you know I, i'd come in and say maybe well let's add a measure here in between this and that just to give me a break for breathe you know let the song breathe in between verse and chorus that's about the most as far as arrangements go they they had everything pretty much set to go and laid out for me uh, hmm. quite easily and, and and man i want to say we probably played 150 shows over 18 months uh so that was that was a lot of touring yeah, you know, we we didn't like it all went back into the band as far as I could tell. Uh, so it wasn't like we were making money doing it. And that was the hardest thing for me because I had two very young children at home. Mm. Here I am, uh, you know, helping build this thing in a grassroots stage for the next level. We were getting good tours. We toured with Obituary. We did uh, a headliner in Europe with uh, with uh, Firebird, which is uh, Bill Steer from Carcasses band at the time and uh then we do a lot of do-it-yourself tours around the states so we, we just go play everywhere and hmm. anywhere uh I, I worked a lot and ended up with not very much to show for it you know at the end of the day i'm i'm not angry about it like i was at the time it was frustrating at the time but you know i mean if if nobody else was getting paid either then you know it is what it is <laughs> Hmm. Uh, I, I think that it was just the band was getting fun. You know, we were funding the next thing oh. with whatever we get paid with, you know, and it's, it's tough when you never pay yourself, man. It, that's I, like, I, I can't do it. Like now when, when we play shows, I have, you know, I have to pay the guys in the band to play the shows. If sure. I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to keep a band, you know? So, yeah. So that's, that's a hard balancing act. I mean, you got paid something I'm assuming, right? It wasn't a hundred percent went into the band. What back then? Yeah, I never got paid anything for playing an Alabama Thunder Pussy gig. What? Though. 
<laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Well, I thought it was just like a percentage. You're saying hundred? You didn't get anything. How about this? Before t- before 2010, I never got paid a dime for playing an exhorter game. Wow. Oh man, it's so heartbreaking to hear these stories. I just I hear too many of these. It's just it's sad to me because you yeah. guys are so talented, and the fact that you're not getting compensated for that, it's just it's heartbreaking. Yeah, you know, I mean, either it all goes back in the band or somebody's getting the money. You know, it's one of the two. <laughs> yeah, because if you're playing, uh, you know, festivals and all these shows, I mean, even a club show, there should be money coming in. There's people paying to get into the show. There's people paying for drinks and things like. I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, under my watch, it's never going to happen that that people are working and not getting paid. It's just, you know, I own a home. I have you know, vehicles in my driveway, I've got to have income, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and all the guys, all the guys in my band are either my age or just a few years within, you know, none of us are looking to do this as a grassroots thing. We've got to make money. You have to, you know? Yeah, no, that's obviously, you know, the thing that's going to drive some of this and just, you got to pay the bills somehow. So yeah. What about uh? So yeah, like I was saying earlier, heaviest Texas. That's what it is. I love that band. Is that band still active? Sort of. Uh, okay. We, we haven't done anything in in over a year, but uh, but it's not like it's not like we just broke up or anything. But what's happened is there's so much going on with Exhorter that we, with me and Marzi being in both bands, we've really just kind of uh, you know, turned our attention to Exhorter and you know, we've got to deal with nuclear blast. We've hmm. got to do a follow up album to mourn the Southern skies. So it, it's, it's, it's taken up a lot of priority. However, um, Marzi's got a lot of stuff he's written that doesn't really fit in with what Exhorter's doing. Hmm. So he's killing two birds with one stone right now. He's writing that, you know, an album, uh, with us for Exhorter, he's writing an album on the side for Heaviest Texas. Oh, okay. And he's got he's got stuff that's also going to be on a solo record, and that's kind of the same thing for me. I'm I'm writing an Exhorter album with the guys. I'm, I'm co-writing a Trouble album with the Trouble guys, and I've got stuff that's going to end up being on a solo album that doesn't fit with either one. So, okay. Yeah, I love the song, King of Fool or King of Fools. Yeah, and to keep a promise, those two especially, those are great songs. And then, are you still doing these other bands? Uh, Pits versus Preps, Devil's Highway, West End. I'm, is that a is that a cover band? West End's just a local cover band. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the, but the other two, are you still are those just one offs or? I mean, it's kind of kind of the same thing. Pits versus Preps just kind of stopped mm. probably about ten years ago, eight eight ten years ago. We just we just hadn't really done anything. Now we have an album in the can that that needs to be released. In fact, I was just talking with one of the guys in the band about that yesterday. Hmm. We're, we're actually going to finally release that second Pitts versus preps album. Um, it's just too good to be sitting there collecting dust. And we, you know, it's our heart and soul. We put a lot into it and it's a really good sounding record. So um, it, it's, there's just so many different, I've got so many irons in the fire, like for me to, to, to get everything done that I need to right now, I'd be either like, a multi-million dollar investor <laughs> or, uh, you know, just like a, you know, a, a team that handles, uh, all of my side things right now. God, that'd be so cool. If I won the lottery and got like that, like, what is the one where it's like, it's like 500 million or something. I would like make so many dreams come true for bands and like for myself. Cause I want to, there's certain bands that like, we I don't ever want to play a show. I'm like, what if I won the lotto? And I paid yeah. you like an absorbent amount of money to reunite. They're like, well, okay, maybe then I'm like, I need to win that lotto. So that would be cool. But yeah. So tell me about your solo record. You said you started writing for that. When is that coming out? Is that have a release date yet? Or is it just. I, the, I, I've actually got some songs that, that I started back in the late nineties that were actually intended to be on the second floodgate album that I finally finished up all these years later. And that some of it's newer stuff within the past, you know, year or five years of, you know, new material, uh, so it, it's going to, it's going to have a uh, mostly a rock flavor, but it's going to have, you know, a lot of different elements to it that uh, I, I have the freedoms and uh, to not be within the, the shackles and confines of the other bands that I'm in, because if, 
if I record and write something for exhorter, it needs to sound like exhorter. Same thing for trouble. It needs to sound like trouble. Trouble is an identifiable band that has its own image. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's not to say that we can't experiment in trouble, but it needs to sound like a trouble record. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with exhorter. But for for floodgate, if I want to do, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, for for my solo ra record rather, if I want to do something that's along the lines of floodgate, I surely can. And then if I want to throw like a I don't know, like a, uh, like a folkies drinking song on there. I can because there's no expectation other than, well, this is Kyle Thomas from this band. Uh, I, I have the freedom to do anything. I can, I can do acapella choral arrangements. If I wanted to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what'd be cool uh, about that too. Is it like if you toured as Kyle Thomas, then you can do stuff from all the bands that you've been in. You can do like your, the greatest hits of your catalog. Cause you have so many bands and bits and pieces. I think that'd be really cool to see a show of your solo. On, cause it, what's that? That you're onto something. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I think that's cause otherwise it's like, like you said, there's certain things that don't fit with all the bands and you can't, you can't do heaviest Texas songs in exhorter. Just they're different. But if you're Kyle Thomas solo, then it's like you do things from everything. That would be cool to see. Sure. I mean, look at the Beatles from start to finish, just uh, and, and a lot of the bands like that, like Rolling Stones from start to finish, that they almost were different bands at, in different time eras that they existed. So but now, like, you know, you go see a Rolling Stones show and if they play uh, Get Off of My Cloud, everyone's hey, it's great. Get off my cloud. And if they do Miss You, which is totally different from that you know or right. uh undercover of the night or start me up you know these songs are all so different different eras of music but it's the rolling stones so you get to see it i don't have that luxury with exhorter because we did three albums and they're all you know fairly similar you know they've got their 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 identifiable differences but uh but it's still exhorter and, and you know for me to go and do a uh you know, some kind of, I don't know, weird, funky, uh, like true funk thing with Exhorter. Exhorter has its funk elements, but I, I, I couldn't get up there and, and do, uh, uh, like, I don't know, um, September by Earth, Wind and Fire, Exhorter style would be weird, you know? <laughs> Can you do those songs though? Cause like you play in these local cover bands. So do you play more mainstream, less heavy stuff in those uh, cover bands? With the cover bands, yeah, the cover bands. I, I really didn't start doing the cover band thing until I want to say about 2010, 2011. Um, and I went down to Bourbon Street and started working in some of the, the house bands there. And it's basically just rock radio hits mostly, you know. But you, it, you might play um, Bad Company, it, you might play Rick Springfield, and you might play Journey, and uh, you might end up playing uh play that funky music white boy you know just whatever the crowd is into but it's 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 based on the hits you know mm -hmm. there's not and it, it, you don't you don't play those kind of gigs without catering to the audience for what it is so you know but but it put a lot of uh money in my pocket and food on the table for my children so that's important uh, for sure yeah. but so i'm assuming that you love playing in your original bands way that's probably way more fun is there what is your favorite i mean you've toured with o overkill obituary sepultura like typo negative i think you've done shows is there one tour or, or band that you played with that really stands out uh we've had some really enjoyable tours over the years um th this last one with overkill was for exhorter it was the most pleasant exhorter tour i've ever done hmm. uh the the band being bigger than ever uh the, the the camaraderie we had with overkill and um the team that we had around us that we had a very happy tour bus and that makes a huge difference yeah. when when there's friction on the tour bus uh it's tough uh, and and throughout the years i've been in a lot of bands where it isn't always that pleasant. You know, the, the trouble tours are always pleasant. Everybody really loves and respects each other greatly in trouble and gets along. That, that, that's it's got a lot to do with the longevity of the lineup is how much everybody gets along. 
Mm. So, uh, so yeah, I'd say that, that the Overkill tour was special, mostly because of you know the pleasant, uh, the pleasantness within our own camp, and uh, the tour that we did, Floodgate and Sepultura. That was uh, that was my first tour on a really nice tour bus, and it's really to this day the only tour where we were exclusively doing like you know big shows like Sepultura on the Roots tour in Europe they were big they were they were set to become one of the biggest things in metal if not the biggest at the time so that was about as top tier of a tour as I could have ever done so you know the the fact that that was my third tour ever fourth tour ever I think and for the rest of the guys in my band, that was their first tour ever. That's and that's the only tour that those guys ever did, the floodgate guys. So they mm. they got introduced to touring by riding on a fancy nightliner, fully catered, you know, playing the, you know, an average of forty five hundred people a night. That's a lot of people. Yeah, that's that's huge for sure. But was that the yeah, one real quick? What's that? You get spoiled quickly that way. Yeah. <laughs> was that the one that like some of the fans didn't embrace you guys as much because of the music style differences between um, you and the, and the headliner? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Except, uh, there, there were a handful of shows on the European mainland that didn't go that way. And in the UK we were charting. So, yeah. So they were, you know, they were happy to see us in the UK, but I think the biggest thing working against us was, we replaced the Deftones and Deftones. That's what it was. Yeah. Literally like went off this tour and we came in almost unannounced and last minute. And, uh, and we surely weren't on the same level as Deftones popularity wise at the time. So to a lot of people, they were like, well, who, you know, who the fuck are these guys, I guess. Or, you know, the fact that we were so immensely different, from Sepultura, Floodgate and Sepultura were definitely very different bands. Uh, you know, and it, that, that's the trick with, with being uh, a support act. If, if you're, if you're a bit of an unknown or if you're a last minute replacement, you've got a really strong chance of having to earn the right from the audience, I think. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm not sure that everybody in my band was prepared for that. <laughs> and uh and sometimes we handled it well and sometimes we didn't uh it was tough you know but we we made it through we i think uh i think we reached a lot more people than we uh but then we had pissed off for for simply being there yeah that's no it's definitely smart i mean 4500 people a night even if you make 10 new fans that's that's you're on the right track exactly yeah so you said i think this is cool like you said after shows that you come hunt and hang out with the fans and you don't but you'll talk about anything you don't want to always talk just music you'll talk anything so do you not do the paid meet and greets ever uh i've been a part of some of those here and there um if i can avoid them i do uh the, the sad truth is that in this day and age with uh streaming and downloading taking precedence over you know, sales of hard copies of, you know, CDs and vinyl. Uh, we, we've got to get creative and, and make yeah. every dime we can get. So, so I, I, I'm not going to say I'll never do the paid meet and greet because I already have done some, but we try as much as possible to give that to the people that support our music. Uh, you know, just the way I, the way I see it is, if it was good enough for Dio, it's good enough for me. And from what I understand, Dio, after every show, would go out and sit with the people and talk to them and answer the questions, sign their stuff until the last person was gone. You know, and I heard he even did that once with like 103 Fever. So to me, wow. it's like, if good enough for Dio, it's good enough for me. And Dio, <laughs> he invented this. I, that's what I hear. Uh, I yeah. guess there's like some fight, like some disagreement about that, but that's what I heard is that he, and I think that's cool. Yeah. 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 There's always somebody that wants to stake a claim to inventing something, you know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> to me, it's less important about who invents what, you know, there, there's plenty of room for everybody. Yeah. Well, you I mean, you've said that you've talked about that before with some other bands, similar sound became more successful and you just said, well, those guys worked harder. Like, I think that's kind of cool in a way because 
you're not like bitter. You're not like, Oh, they ripped us off. They're like they worked harder than us. Like that's cool that you could recognize that. And now you're like, okay, now I learned from those mistakes and now you want to work harder. I think that's really cool. Yeah. I, you know, I, I can't say the same for everybody. Uh, I, I, I don't like to speak for other on behalf of other people when I, you know, without their blessing or, mm-hmm. or for no good reason, but it, it, all, all the, you know, who invented what in, you know, I, I've been, I've been a part of three or four different bands that have uh, somewhere along the line been hailed as pioneers in what they do. I, I, I seem to always, I mean, Exhorter are hailed as pioneers. Some people say Floodgate were pioneers with that genre. Uh, Alabama Thunderpuss and he certainly were pioneers with what they were doing. And Trouble, for the love of God, are pioneers of what they do. And I've been a member of each of those bands. Does that make me like some sort of great innovator? Not necessarily. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the, the simple fact is that I keep finding my way you know, into, into things that, that, that are carving paths or, or have carved paths at some point, but it doesn't matter to me what the path I've carved already is. I, I'm looking for what's happening next. And, and I feel like I surely haven't reached my, uh, my pinnacle yet and what I'm supposed to be doing musically for myself and for my career and for my legacy. So my, my great quest is always the next song, the next album. Like, like, let's make a better one than the last one. Let's, you know, if if this one didn't connect with people as much as the other ones, let's figure out why and 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 try to make the next one the one that does. That's awesome. I fucking love that. So, what's else? What else on the horizon? Because I I checked on Exhorter's website. I, didn't, I only saw like two shows. Are you guys going to tour in that band, or are you touring in other bands? Are you going to do some local shows or? What's on the uh, horizon coming up for Exhorter? For everything. What else? I mean, you said so. Is Exhorter have a new album coming out? I only heard the single, which was really good. Uh, we're we're writing now. Um, okay. This this next month, we are actually at the end of August. We're going into the studio to start really piecing these songs we've been writing since the pandemic. Uh, it, it basically, we're we're in pre production for a new album right now. So. Okay. I, when it will be out, I don't know. I can't see it being out before the end of this year. Uh, more than likely, sometime spring, summer of next year All it, right. uh, is a more realistic idea when it could come out. And probably the same thing for Trouble with that new album. So next year, I, I'd like to think I'll have two brand new albums out. And and once those albums are completed, I'm going to get more serious about my solo album. Okay, I, I've I've got about six or seven original songs that are demoed out right now and, and a remake or two uh, along the way. But uh, I want to, I want to, the bands that I'm a part of that I have people counting on me for, I, I want to get that prioritized before I really start sure. getting too, too into my solo album. Uh, it's okay to do the pre-production and the early recordings and the structuring of the songs, but to actually commit to going in the studio to record that album it's going to take a while and I, I, I don't have time for it right now. I've got sure. uh, trouble and exhorter albums to finish. Who Now, who do you, or where do you record? Um, do you, do you, do you ever work with Dave Fortman? Cause I know he lives down there. You worked Dave with him on Fort- Jones lounge, right? I think. Yeah. He actually engineered that. And, uh, um, I, I haven't worked with Dave on anything else. Uh, I, I see Dave, I don't know, once every five years or, or, or less. And, uh, uh, I, I think the world of him, he's, he's a good guy and uh, a hell of an engineer and, you know, great musician also. Yeah. But uh, basically I do all of my recording at home, uh, uh, you know, and if I can, you know, and if I have to go into the studio, the real studio to do, you know, like when we go to record drums and, and guitar tracks and bass and stuff, it's always best to do it in a, a, a true studio format. But, uh, it, you know, with, with the right vocal setup, I, I just do it here at home. Yeah. Okay. I'm just, I'm just curious. Like, I just thought, man, that'd be kind of a cool combination. The two of you on the solo, I mean, he might be a good fit for maybe a song or maybe co-write or something. I mean, he's, yeah, he's so talented. The two of you working together, I think that would be really cool. Um, so tell me what else, 
uh, New Orleans. I'm going there for the first time. I'm so excited. So tell me, what do I need to do? What are the cool clubs? Where's all the voodoo stuff? What are the good places to eat? What do I need? What do I need to do? Oh my goodness, man. There's so much good stuff here. Uh, when are you planning on coming? Uh, well, the only thing that sucks is like, I think we're coming on like a Tuesday, but it's in a couple of weeks. We're doing like a road trip. We're going to go to Nashville and then we're going to drive down South and then go through. We're spending one night in new Orleans. And so I'm going to try to do gotcha. as much well, as I can. Do yourself a favor. If you're going to be staying in the city and even if you're not, it's worth the Uber ride, uh, if you're in the suburbs, but restaurant rebirth, uh, chef Ricky Sheremy, uh, is absolutely the best and the restaurant is just an award winning uh, an award winning uh, institution uh and it's just slowly rising 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 amongst the most popular restaurants in the uh, greater new orleans area uh ricky's ricky's a personal friend but he's uh, if he if he made terrible food i wouldn't go <laughs> okay well, i'll have to check that out yeah and yeah that's uh that's downtown uh right by the convention center, really amazing food, restaurant rebirth. Don't forget it. Okay. But also, um, there's, you know, there's a lot to see The city park has all kind of, uh, they got a, an art museum there, uh, New Orleans museum of art. There's, uh, there's free, uh, sculpture gardens and, uh, botanical gardens. Um, that's, that's always really nice. Also, if you're going to the French quarter, uh, if you, you know, walk along the French market, there's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, cool stuff to see there along the river front. It's, it's just, there's, there's almost nothing you can do in new Orleans. That's a terrible time. But what's the, where's the good, like voodoo thing. That's what I really want. I'm really interested in the voodoo. I want to see it. Like, I don't want the touristy, like commercial one. I want like the one that's like in the back alley, like the real guy that's really going to freak me out. I don't know, to be honest. You don't, you. you don't ever, you never <laughs> explore that stuff. No, man, I don't need to. Okay. <laughs> That's right. You were raised Catholic, same as me. Yeah, you know, I, I just, I, it's nothing I ever chased down after. Uh, I, I admire it greatly, and it, the mystique of it is, uh, obviously, it, 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 it crept into the imagery on our last album, with More in the Southern Skies, with the voodoo doll on the front, you know, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's not my, that's not my place. <laughs> but you did see a ghost once I heard, man, I've seen, I've seen more things that I shouldn't have seen in my lifetime. <laughs> oh shit. I, I, I've seen, I, I've seen weird things. Uh, I've had weird things happen to me. I've seen things in the sky that I can't explain. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a believer in a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I not to the point where I want to, go out and chase it. Now I never had a bad experience, but still it's like, I don't know that I want to like, you know, what's going on in here. You know? <laughs> no, like, well, I heard hoodoo is different than voodoo and hoodoo is good magic or so. I don't know. That's that's, I'm just, I'm curious about it. I'm a little scared though, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I love embracing the culture and I just feel like that's gotta be a part of, and definitely the jazz. Is there a good life? Hopefully I can find live jazz on a Tuesday. I don't know. I'm assuming there's if, somewhere. Yeah. If you go to Frenchman street okay. in the, uh, in the Faubourg Marigny, the, uh, in the evenings, they have a strip on, on the first couple of blocks of Frenchman street that, nothing but nightclubs, you know, and they got some rock there too, but it's mostly like, uh, funk blues, traditional jazz, cool. uh, fusion, anything like that. Just real new Orleans music. You know, if you go bourbon street, you're going to see guys like me singing Jesse's girl. And okay. that's, you know, it's okay to see that yeah. once in your life, you know, but I can see that here. I want to see the real live jazz and blues. Go to Frenchman street. Okay. Go to Frenchman. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I'd like to end each episode with a charity. I think you said there was one that you work with or you want to promote here at the end. Yes. Yes. Uh, my, my sister actually has a foundation. Mm. She's a cancer survivor, breast cancer survivor. And I always try to help her uh, along with spreading the word on that one. It's the Karen T. Stahl Research and Breast Institute. And uh, you can find them on Facebook. Uh, but they're, they're an amazing charity. They, uh, they've they been instrumental in helping uh, make a 3D mammography 
oh. which is really, really, really possible. Uh, it's 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 so much easier to detect yeah. breast cancer with a 3D image versus the 2D. Uh, I saw a demonstration on it once, and it's it's incredible how much more effective it is. But it used to be such that only privileged people could afford to have this done, and my sister pushed really hard to make it available for everybody. Oh, that's awesome. So, what is it? So Karen T. Stone, is that what you said? Stahl, S-T-A-L-L. Oh, okay. I will put that in the notes. Uh, I'll, I'll be able to find that link and put it in the notes so people just click that. And uh, the Exhorter website. And uh, wait, do you have a, you don't have a Kyle Thomas website, do you? I do. In fact, I okay. can send you, I'll send you some links that okay. will show you uh, everything for Exhorter, everything for Kyle Thomas. Okay. And I'll send you a link for the Karen T. Stoll Research and Breast Institute. All right, I'll put that all in the notes. So thanks so much, Kyle. This has been a really educational and really fun. Yeah. Chuck, it was a good interview. You had good questions. And Thank you. I, I appreciate being informed. It doesn't always happen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, every time for me. Thanks. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right. Take care. Have All a right. great week. Bye bye. You too. Bye. Kyle Thomas. So talented. Uh, check the show notes for all the links. You can find Kyle's music. You can get merch. They have some really cool stuff. And you can even get singing lessons from Kyle if you're so inclined. So make sure to follow Kyle and all his bands on social media to keep up with what he's doing. And if you want to keep up with my show, I suggest you do the same and follow me on social media. And also your shares, likes, and comments on there and on YouTube as well help me out quite a bit. And speaking of YouTube, also if you can do me a favor and subscribe to the YouTube channel, that would really help me out. I'm really pushing to try to get to 1,000 subscribers. We're about halfway there currently, and with your help, we'll get there sooner. So thank you so much for listening and supporting the show. Have a great rest of your day, and remember to shoot for the moon.